Good morning, everyone, and thank you for being here. Uh, our first speaker today is Takeshi Matsumoto from Kyoto University, and he will be talking about physical insights from a numerical simulation of the dissipative oil of flow. Takeshi, you can begin. Thank you. So good morning, everyone. So uh, this morning, I will uh, talk about uh, numerical simulation. And uh, this is a simulation of uh, highly mathematical solution of the so-called uh, weak. Yeah, it's a so-called weak solution of the three-dimensional oil equation uh, in can periodic. Yes? A little louder. Ah, OK, sorry. Uh, maybe I should. Uh... OK, let me. Increase the volume. It, it, how is it now? Is it better or still? Thank you. Is it okay? Okay. So, so it's a weak, so-called weak solution of the three-dimensional, yeah, incompressible three-dimensional Euler equation in the periodic domain, and uh, I begin with the. Uh, the classical scaling theory of uh, turbulent flow, the viscous turbulent flow. So as you know, uh, the Kolmogorov scaling, the celebrated scaling theory for the turbulent flow goes like this. So the energy spectrum as a function of wave number K, and let's assume now the flow is statistically steady state. So the energy spectrum doesn't depend on time in, in the average sense. So the energy spectrum goes like energy dissipation rate to some power two thirds. And uh, here's a wave number to the famous exponent minus five third. And this minus five third spectrum holds in so-called inertia range. So this is a wave number range, which is uh, between the large scale and the scale where the dissipation is dominant. And in the physical space, uh, we talk about the, the velocity increment, the velocity difference between the point X and X plus R. And uh, the Kolmogorov scaling law tells us that, that this velocity increment goes like uh, energy dissipation rate to one third and now the, the spatial difference R appears here and with the power one third. So this is a Kolmogorov scaling and this scaling holds between the so-called this Kolmogorov dissipation length scale, eta, and uh, capital L is some characteristic length scale for the large scale. Typically it's a scale where we add the forcing. So this energy dissipation rate, epsilon, can be written with the uh, kinematic viscosity times in the wave number space, it, the second order derivative, the Laplacian, sorry, the Laplacian can be written, uh, the modulus of K squared, and this U hat is the velocity, the Fourier mode of the velocity and squared. So this is a nice expression for the energy dissipation rate in the Fourier space. In the physical space, we, uh, we use uh, the, this form squared integral over whole space. And this capital V is the volume of the fluid. And this new is the kinematic viscosity. And the, the fundamental assumption of this argument, the column of scaling is that this, is this one. Sometimes it's called a dissipative anomaly. So as the kinematic viscosity tends to zero, the energy dissipation rate becomes some constant which is the independent of the kinematic viscosity. So this is the, uh, maybe the most important assumption in the Kolmogorov scaling argument. But now we know um, the, the turbulent flow is uh, not as simple as uh, the Kolmogorov scaling theory tells us. So in fact, the velocity increment has some general exponent h, here I write h, and h is not um, just one third, but h can be uh, other values like uh, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.2, and so on. So uh, this uh, 
idea was proposed in 1985 by Parisi and Frisch, and which was discussed yesterday. So this is a so-called multi-factor model. So this is, uh, yeah, some warm up of, uh, of my talk, of this present talk. So um, in the previous slide, I gave a definition of the energy dissipation in terms of the kinematic viscosity and integral of this velocity uh, derivative. But this, uh, this is just one definition, and let's assume now the turbulent flow is in a statistically steady state. Yeah, let's assume there's a forcing, and the energy uh, input by the forcing is uh, the same in on average as the dissipation. So in that case, the the dissipation uh, taken out from the dissipation, the energy dissipation rate. Uh, taken out from the flow by the viscosity is equal to the energy input rate. So the input is coming from the large scale forcing, but in the inertia range, there's an energy flux and this energy flux is equal to the energy dissipation rate in the dissipation range. And at the same time, this energy flux is the same as in the, as the energy input rate from the forcing, large scale forcing on average sense. So uh, this energy flux, uh, here I write it with, as a pi sub r, r denotes some scale. And uh, but in the energy cascade of a turbulent flow, uh, usually uh, this relation holds. So the energy flux, is uh, basically, so this energy flux should depends on some scale or sometimes it's called a grid scale. And uh, this energy flux in general depends on scale R, but the uh, turbulent cascade, the energy flux becomes scale independent. So that is uh, probably the most significant property of the turbulent flow. So this energy flux pi can be calculated in the physical space in this way. So this bar is uh, low pass filtered velocity. So this GR is a low pass filter function. So basically it pass a component uh, smaller than R, oh, sorry, larger than R. And uh, this U bar R has a component the velocity activities uh, living in uh, larger than the scale R. So this, uh, using this filter, spatial filter function, we can define the energy flux in, in this manner. So, and here's a nice uh, energy budget equation for this U bar. So this uh, U bar squared, so this the time derivative of the u bar square can be written in this way. So this pi, the energy flux appears here. So if uh, pi is positive, so this energy flux basically takes out the energy from the, the scale larger than r. So, um, yeah, let's, uh, let's do some heuristic argument. So suppose uh, in the inviscid state, so namely the kinematic viscosity is zero. In this inviscid situation, if the flux becomes positive and are independent, yeah, let's suppose such things uh, can be realized in, uh, in some fluid flow, then uh, we can regard this term as uh, dissipation for this guy. So the variation of the energy is uh, basically decreased by this guy. So th this is in fact uh, coming from the nonlinear term of the Navier-Stokes equation, but for the velocities living in scale larger than R, this term can act as a dissipation. Okay, and the, uh, there's a very uh, 
interesting argument along this line. So uh, one can derive uh, this relationship. So this is basically the, the third order structure function of the velocity. Uh, it's a, yeah, okay, so it's a longitudinal structure function, third order longitudinal structure function, integral over the surface of a sphere, and this the sphere with the radius r. And uh, so this is basically the surface average of the third order structure function is equal to the minus four fifth times this flux times r. So uh, this is exactly the same as the uh, Goromogorov's four fifth law. So uh, this suggests that the, the, this energy flux, if it becomes R independent and positive, then um, this pi, the flux, can be regarded as uh, dissipation. Okay, so this is, uh, Yeah, then um, I'd like to talk about the so-called Onsager conjecture. So Onsager, uh, yeah, there's a very famous paper by Onsager published in 1949. And he argued that the in principle turbulent dissipation as, de as described in his paper could take place just as readily without the final assistance by viscosity. This is a very cryptic uh, message, but that, that has been decoded by uh, Gregory Eink and uh, other people. And uh, now we understood his conjecture um, very well. And that, that can be described in two parts. So the part one, the energy of the oil equations can be dissipated when, yeah, this is a, uh, velocity increments. So if the velocity increments behaves like R to the exponent H, and if H is between zero and one third and one third included, and if this condition holds, then there are some oil solutions of oil equations which dissipates the energy. So this is a conjecture. And the other part, but the part two is if the exponent is larger, larger than one third, the energy, the all the solutions of the oil equations, uh, the energy cannot be dissipated. So this is uh, what Onsager conjectured in 1949. So the, the second part, uh, let's say the supercritical because H is uh, larger than one third, the supercritical part was proven in 1994 by Ayn, Constantine E and T. And uh, the part one, was uh, much, much harder than part two. And it was proven recently by Duleli, Sekehidi, and Danedi, and Iset, and Backmaster, and so on. So th th these are mathematical proof. And uh, yeah, so uh, just I focus on the paper by Backmaster and others, and they, they have proved the Onsager conjecture, the, the subcritical part of the Onsager conjecture by constructing solutions, uh, weak solutions, yeah, so-called weak solutions to the incompressible oil equations. Yeah, so mathematicians uh, solved the equations. That was uh, quite impressive. So uh, their solutions uh, satisfies the periodic boundary condition in 3D and their solutions is uh, dynamic. It's not a stationary solution. And also their constructed, their mathematically constructed solution has uh, nice scaling. So their solution satisfies this equation. So this looks quite interesting and uh, we like to, for example, uh, yeah, take their solutions and I like to uh, visualize it with a standard method of uh, fluid mechanics or computational fluid mechanics. 
or yeah, if we can, uh, we can implement some numerical simulations of the of the mathematical constructions proposed by Backmaster et al. So that's our purpose. And uh, so um, in the remaining time, I will talk about how to uh, numerically simulate the mathematical constructions given in this paper. And uh, we like to uh, interpret what they are doing in the mathematical construction in terms of uh, physics language or in terms of uh, fluid dynamical language. And uh, yeah, we like to have uh, some nice insight uh, from those constructed solutions or the constructions method itself. So that's the, yeah, our goal. And uh, the work is still ongoing, so I cannot give uh, the concise summary of the insights yet. But anyway, uh, let us begin. So this is the one example. It's a vorticity field, isosurface of the vorticity field, uh, the magnitude of the vorticity field of uh, the constructed solution. So uh, I will talk about how to uh, construct those solutions. Okay, so uh, yeah, as, as you can see, uh, it has a lot of uh, tube-like vortices, but uh, you can at the same time notice there are some regularities. It's not quite random, but it's uh, they are distorted and uh, okay. So um, let us quickly look at the uh, what the what the mathematicians mean by weak solutions. So uh, this is the incompressible Euler equation as written in the textbook in fluid dynamics. So for the weak solution, we need the so-called test function. So the test function is a smooth function, which has a finite support in space and time. And uh, basically uh, we calculate the convolution of the velocity field with uh, this test function. And that gives us, the coarse grained, spatially coarse grained and temporally coarse grained uh, velocity field, which I denote by U bar. So um, we uh, then uh, like to uh, consider uh, the equation for this U bar, basically. So then uh, basically, so that's, uh, we multiply the test function by this equation, Euler equation, and then we perform the integration by parts. Then uh, we get this kind of equation. So this is a so-called weak form of the Euler equation. And the uh, weak solution is uh, given by this uh, weak form of the Euler equation if uh, you hold for all the test functions, then uh, that, that is called the weak solutions of the Euler equations. And there are several famous examples of uh, weak solutions, which are constructed mathematically by Schaeffer and Schneiderman. And yes, there's a good tradition of those activities. Okay. Okay, so uh, let me go to some details of the, uh, the mathematical construction uh, given in this paper. So the constructed velocity field, so it's a weak solution to the Euler equation. So it's a time dependent and the space is in the unit periodic cube. The time is from zero to some large time, capital T. And the capital T can be uh, some arbitrary large number. And their method admits two inputs. So the first one is the total energy as a function of time. We can prescribe this energy function from zero to capital T uh, rather freely. And the second input is the exponent h. So the h is uh, the exponent for the velocity increment. So we can specify from the beginning but h should be between zero and one third. 
and they construct the solutions in an iterative manner. So uh, we start with some initial guess, uh, U0, and U0 should be uh, given uh, in space-time. And uh, from this uh, initial velocity, uh, we add some, so some velocity field, W, and then we have uh, this velocity field for the second iteration. So we iterate uh, this process, and then, uh, yeah, of course, uh, the ch how to choose this W is the, the, the most um, complicated and uh, very uh, interesting part of the mathematical construction. And if we continue this iteration, then uh, as the, the iteration number, sorry, this is, this is not n, this is q, as, uh, the, as you iterate this process to infinity, then the uq tends to some velocity field, and this gives you the weak solution of the Euler equation. So that's uh, the way how, how they constructed the weak solution. And <clears throat> this uq, the velocity fields of the qth iterated uh, velocity field has uh, some characteristic wave number. So this is uh, basically, the, one can regard this as the largest wave number for this uq. And this largest wave number of uq uh, varies like this one. So q is the number of iteration and a and b is some constant, but it's, grows faster than exponential. So it is a bit more, yeah, it, yeah, it is not bit, sorry. It, it is rather demanding condition for the numerical simulation. Okay, so, so um, their way of constructing solutions of is iteration, iteration iterative construction. And uh, the, this UQ in fact satisfies the following equation. The full, so th this is not the weak form. This is the, the, the strong form, what, 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 uh, what we call the strong form. And the UQ satisfies Euler equation plus some additional term. And this RQ is an additional three by three tensor, which was called Reynolds stress by those, the authors. And uh, this Reynolds stress tensor tends to zero as the number of iterations goes to infinity. Sorry, this is not zero, this is infinity. Okay, so um, just to uh, illustrate the process. So uh, we start with the initial guess, U zero. So it's given in some periodic box and uh, we must specify this initial guess uh, also for the all the, all, all the time domain from zero to capital T. So we start with uh, initial guess, and then we iterate the process. So we have U1, so U1 should have some energy E1, and we uh, continue this process. Then we reach the prescribed E of T. So this is uh, one way of uh, looking at the process. So um, if our prescribed energy has a decreasing part, then that corresponds to the energy dissipation. Okay, so um, the UQ, the velocity field in the Qth uh, iterated, uh, the Qth iterate solution, and the, there's a pressure that can be determined by the uh, solenoidal condition. So the, this UQ is not the strong solutions of Euler equation. So if we put this UQ into the Euler equation, then there is uh, some error. So I wrote the error by uh, EQ, E sub Q, and E sub Q can also be uh, written in a divergence of some three by three tensor. So this is a Reynolds stress. So, um, yeah, there should be some non-zero error. And uh, yeah, let's uh, consider the second iteration, Q plus one. So this U, U, Q plus one P 
q plus one can be constructed by adding w and capital q and then uh, this uq satisfies the same kind of equation and this error at the q plus one iteration can be written with uh, this wq and capital q in this way so uh, the what we want to do is to have this error getting smaller and smaller as we increase the iteration q. So uh, in order to do that, um, we like to design this wq plus one to decrease this guy from this one. So uh, yeah, so that's a mathematical strategy uh, Backmaster and other and collaborators considered in the paper. Okay, so uh, yeah, what we want to do is this, uh, the error at Q plus one iteration should be smaller than the error at the Q, the iteration number Q. And uh, yeah, this W is, uh, is taken uh, as some fastly oscillating flow. And uh, in the sense that this, U Q, the tensor product of uq and wq plus one is nearly zero. And uh, also this w is composed of uh, space stationary solutions to the Euler equation. So th that means wq plus one satisfies this equation. Okay. So, um, but at the same time, yeah, we, we talked about how to decrease the error, but the, uh, there's other constraint that is namely coming from the energy function. So we prescribed the energy as a function of time from the beginning, in the beginning. So we like to, uh, yeah, we like to, so the, there's the energy for the u q plus one. So what we like to do is to uh, make this energy closer to the to the prescribed energy function. So then, then that can be done by, uh, in, in fact, choosing this w in a rather clever way and okay. So uh, I just don't go into the details. So um, I, I talked about the, the two uh, requirements in the construction. So uh, we like to configure this WQ plus one to satisfy the two uh, requirements. The first one is the, the cancel of the error and that can be uh, achieved by considering this kind of equation. This is a explicit expression for the error. And if this part becomes nearly zero, then we can achieve the decreasing the error. And the, the second requirement is the, um, the energy. So we like to make the energy of UQ getting closer to the prescribed energy. So now we have uh, two uh, constraints or two uh, roughly equations for the W, the velocity field W. And uh, how to, yeah, so then how to construct the W in a more specific specific way. So um, the mathematicians, Backmaster and uh, et al. noticed that if some special flow, capital W, satisfying this kind of relation, so it's a tensor product of uh, some vector field, incompressible vector field, satisfies this one. So this S is a symmetric three by three tensor. And uh, yeah, basically this is the integral form of this, this equation. And uh, if we have 
this nice capital W velocity field, then uh, we can make this small w by using this capital W. Then, so this uh, small w can be uh, expressed with this capital W satisfying this equation in this manner. So uh, this S is now a rather complicated form. So it's a constraint from the energy times identity tensor and the error, the Reynolds stress. Yeah, this is basically uh, the error at the, the QC iteration. Okay. <clears throat> then the remaining task is how to calculate the error. Yeah, if, you, if we can calculate the error, then we can calculate the uh, W field. And then, then I will talk about what's the capital W should look like. Okay, so um, in order to uh, calculate the Reynolds stress or the error, so the idea is proposed by ISET in 2018. Um, he proposed to use uh, the following uh, rather complicated, um, but I think quite, uh, yeah, clever way of, uh, calculating the error. So suppose we are in the nth iteration. So we have a velocity field u sub n. And let's take some two instances. So from this time, we solve the classical Euler equation by using this un as an initial data. So we take the un of this time as initial data and we solve the classical Euler equation forward in time until some time. Okay, so then at this time, we take the un of this time, then uh, we solve the classical Euler equation backward in time from here. So we take this un in, as an initial data here, and then we solve the uh, Euler equation backward in time in this manner. So the gluing is to superpose two classical Euler, the solution, two classical solutions of uh, the classical Euler solution, Euler equation. The superposing those two equations. And uh, I said, argue that uh, the, the Reynolds stress can be calculated explicitly. So that can be done. So it's a rather quite a rather complicated. So uh, it's a forward solution. It's a backward solution. They satisfy the Euler equation, the classical Euler equation, incompressible Euler equation, and the gluing. So it's a superposition of the forward solution and the backward solution. This chi is uh, some smooth function um, varying be between zero and one. And uh, so this glued velocity field. is not uh, the solution of the Euler equation, but this uf and uv are, are, the solution, are the solution of the Euler equation. So the equation for u tilde can be written in this way because uf and uv satisfies the Euler equation. So um, on the right-hand side, this corresponds to the error at the the qth iterated the qth iteration, so this uh, Reynolds stress tensor can be uh, explicitly given in terms of the forward solution and backward solution. So that's the idea. So th this is a way to calculate the the Reynolds stress or error explicitly. Okay, so I come back to the uh, the capital W. So it's a special uh, velocity field, incompressible velocity field, satisfying this uh, tensor equation. So it's a tensor product and this, the integral over all domain gives you uh, some given constant three by three uh, uh, positive definite tensor. And, uh, and in Danelli and Sikehidi 2016 shows that the, the six pairs of axiometric jets. So they, this is actually the, yeah, so here I showed you the six pairs of axiometric jets. 
in uh, uh, yeah this is uh, in fact uh, the iso contour of the vorticity of these uh, six pairs of axisymmetric jets so the, this is called the Mikado flow in this paper but there are uh, six pairs of jets so there are the 12 uh, jets in total but they are uh, the the direction of the jets are okay. So the pair of the jets, uh, yeah, in the pair of the jets, the the direction of the jets are opposite, and so that they the the spatial integral of the of the velocity is zero. Okay, so. Um, Basically, the the jet is the profile of the jet is a Gaussian, and uh, there's here's a Gaussian uh, width and uh, Gaussian strength, and this is a central line, or let me call it the, the spine of the jet, and uh, this plus and minus corresponds to the pair, and this kappa it, it corresponds to the direction of each jet. And if we give uh, the capital W in terms of this function, then the tensor product becomes this kind of uh, equations. And uh, this capital Sij is some given number, then we can solve for this gamma M. Then we can have uh, the solution of this equation. So that's a trick of the Mikado flow. So, um, Here's the last ingredient of the mathematical construction. Yeah, we prescribed exponent h for the velocity field. And uh, we talked about the, the Mikado flow and uh, I will explain it, how to uh, achieve this condition by using this Mikado flow. So the energy spectrum of this Mikado flow, the, it, this is uh, basically the six pairs of jets, axisymmetric jets. The energy spectrum of the Mikado flow should look like looks like this. So uh, it has some flat part, and then it decreases rather quickly. So decrease is basically the Gaussian. So um, the constructed solution during the iteration has uh, this kind of structure and uh, this structure can be uh, in a heuristic manner can be expanded with the capital W. So this is a Mikado flow. And uh, so this Mikado flow has some scaling property and this wave number Km sits here. So, and this Km uh, can be uh, appear in this way. So uh, this formula, can be visualized in this right figure. So this is uh, K1 to the power minus H. So this blue green line is uh, K2 minus H. So this summation corresponds to the summation over this these spectrums. And that gives you, uh, as a result, that gives you uh, some nice scaling law. So this is a way to uh, having the prescribed exponent h. Okay, so uh, of course uh, the mathematical construction have some nice bounds and uh, those bounds are quite important for the mathematical proof, but uh, here I skip it. And yeah, this is also uh, some formal uh, protocol of the iteration, but I, here I skip it. Okay, so, um, the precise form of the Raynaud stress uh, can be uh, given in this way, and uh, the W velocity fields can be, uh, yeah, the, act, the precise form of the W is rather complicated. It's not just W, but it involves the, uh, the Lagrangian, the Lagrangian so-called inverse um, level map. So it is A is the Lagrangian coordinate. Okay, so anyway, uh, now I uh, 
quickly uh, show you uh, the simulation results and then uh, I end my talk. Okay, so uh, here I showed you uh, the example of my simulation. So um, let me mention the first, uh, the difficulty of the numerical implementation of the mathematical proof. So as I told you, uh, the Qth step velocity field has a characteristic wave number and this that wave number K sub Q grows super exponentially. And uh, I, here I have set the parameter A, B as three and 1.15 and alpha is some other parameters which I didn't mention in the talk. And uh, I prescribe the energy as a function of time in the linear. And th this A is quite small, but it's a decreasing function. And I prescri my prescribed exponent here is uh, 0 0.30. So the initial guess or initial velocity field is just zero. Then um, I put this u0 to the, the mathematical construction or, new, or just a numerical <laughs> version of the iteration. Then we have u1. So the energy of U1 looks like this one. So it has some oscillations, time dependence, and then flat and some time dependence and flat. And then uh, from U1, we can go to U, U2 by using the Mikado flow and so on. Then from U2 and U, we can calculate the U3. So it's a blow up of this one. So this purple line is a prescribed energy. So uh, we can approach prescribed energy uh, rather slowly. Okay, so this is the vorticity field for the, the U, uh, U1. So this is a Mikado flow, but for the, yeah, in ideal situation, the thickness of those jets are as thin as possible. But for the numerical simulation, it's uh, quite troublesome. Uh, we, should, we should set some finite thickness. So in that sense, uh, this Mikado flow, the numerical Mikado flow is uh, rather thick and uh, that may have some um, yeah, bad effect. Okay, anyway, uh, yeah, we must deal with it. And the, the U1, the constructed uh, the first iteration, uh, the constructing the first iteration looks like this one. So it's basically uh, the tiling of the Mikado flow. So you can count how to uh, tile the Mikado flow in this one. So it's basically so one, two, three, four. So actually uh, four by four by four tiling. The U1 is given by the uh, four by four by four tiling of this fundamental Mikado flow. So uh, yeah, by tiling, I mean uh, just putting the scaling, we scale this fundamental Mikado flow by one fourth in each direction. And then uh, we tile this uh, scaled Mikado flow all over the periodic domain. Then we have this U1. The time dependence of this U1 is just uh, some uh, oscillation. So it's, uh, oh, it, yeah, it's just like in a standing wave. Yeah, for the U2, uh, I just repeat the process, but in this time, it's not just a tiling, but it involves the uh, gluing. So uh, we solve the Euler equation for a short time and uh, we superpose the forward time, forward time solution and backward in time solutions. That gives you uh, some nice wiggles. But it's basically, yeah, it involves the tiling of the Mikado flow. And so this is a U5. And uh, you, for the U5, yeah, it's quite messy and complicated and it involves uh, into the, third tiling of the Mikado flow. But again, uh, it involves the, uh, solving the classical Euler equations. So those uh, vortices are slightly wiggled. Okay, so the energy spectrum for the constructed velocity field 
for the q equals to two, three, four, five. So the two u two is this one. So the characteristic wave number is something somewhere like this one. So u three is this one. So this is green. So there are lots of curves because I plotted energy spectrum instantaneous. Uh, energy spectrum for different times. So the so this this set of energy spectrum corresponds to U4 and this orange curves corresponds to U5. Yeah bad news is that uh, yeah this energy spectrum doesn't exhibit uh, prescribed scaling or so that's that this is uh, rather bad news for me but the, the resolution is is not very high. There may be a nice scaling law as we increase the number of iterations larger than five, but it can be uh, quite demanding in uh, in terms of the memory and time. Okay, so this is the physical space longitudinal structure functions for the U2, U3, and U4, and U5. Yeah, contrary to the energy spectrum, uh, for the structure function, uh, there are yeah there are some straight regions which may be uh, related to the prescribed exponent. So the prescribed exponent uh, r to the two h h is uh, 0.3 in this case. It looks like this one. So uh, u five uh, yeah as we increase the uh, number of iterations. Uh, the structure functions seems to approach to the prescribed exponent yeah, in the physical space. In the spectral space, yeah, that kind of uh, approaching behavior was not clearly observed. Okay, fourth order. So, um, for, yeah, for the fourth order, uh, yeah, the scaling range is not really impressive and we don't know uh, for sure uh, there is a scaling range, but still uh, for the U5, so U5 is orange. So there may be some straight region. And uh, yeah, if we regard this straight region as a inertia range, then the exponent is close to 0.4. So R to the 4H, so H is prescribed 0.3 is this one. So it's uh, quite different from the uh, prescribed exponent. But the, here's another problem. So uh, let's assume this 0 0.40 is the scaling exponent of the uh, U5. And uh, that corresponds to the following situation. So this zeta four is point uh, four zero. So the it's a scaling exponent for the fourth order structure function. This zeta two is a scaling exponent or for the second order structure function. In this case, it's uh, point six. So zeta four is smaller than zeta two, and uh, that has uh, serious consequences. And uh, this decreasing even order uh, scaling exponent of the structure function implies unboundedness of the velocity. And uh, right, so that, that can be a rather strange consequences. And uh, yeah, here I have uh, some problem. And this, this appears to be problem because of the finite iteration number or it persists forever, I don't know at the moment. Okay, so the, this is my final slide. So uh, I looked at the probability density function of the longitudinal velocity increment. So this is all, all the curves are taken from the U5 and the, uh, the spatial difference of the velocity increment is taken from this range and the PDF looks like this. And uh, this PDF is normalized. The mean is zero and the standard deviation is one. And those three PDFs do not collapse. And that implies uh, the self-similarity is broken. 
And yeah, this is a rather, in my opinion, rather clean result. So that means uh, the constructed solutions may be uh, multifractal. Okay, so here's a summary. So I talked about the Onsaga conjecture and they, it has something to do with the uh, energy dissipation of the Euler equation. And uh, I explained one, uh, mathemat one way of constructing such energy dissipative weak Euler solution. And we talked about the numerical results but the the numerical results is always a limited always has a limitation the, for example the iteration number is finite and the scaling range is finite and so on okay so um this is uh, the end of my talk and i stop here and uh, thank you for your attention and uh, i thank the organizers giving me the chance to talk about this uh, our ongoing work thank you so much Thank you so much, Dr. Matsumoto. Thank you. Um, and have some questions from the audiences now, if anyone. Thank you, Takeshi. Uh, yes. This um, procedure that you have of generating the solution. Yes. Does this uh, lead to a unique solution or is uh, is that clear or not? Uh, okay. Um, right. So yeah, yeah. The, the numerical, uh, yeah, my numerical code generate one solution, and uh, this is just one solution. And uh, it is known that uh, the weak solutions of Euler equations is not unique. So uh, to see that non-uniqueness, that is, given a specified E of T, yep. given a specified uh, exponent H, yes. there could be another way of generating a weak solution, but it doesn't follow this procedure, which would yield the same E of T and the same H. For the yeah, I, I think that's possible, yeah. See. I think, uh, yeah. That's possible. Yeah, it's and uh, yeah, it, it, I guess so. Yeah, there are other way or or slightly variant, slightly different way of uh, constructing a specific flow field. And even though the k's increase very rapidly as a to the b to the q. Exactly. Exactly. Five twelve cubed is enough to uh, fit them in. Uh, okay, so um, yeah, okay, so with uh, 500, probably uh, U5, yeah, it can be quite dangerous, but the U4 up to four, yes. uh, it is okay. I see. I see, well, it's a real tour de force. Okay, thank <laughs> you. I have nothing else to say. Uh, can you generate using your method a singular solution of Euler equations? Uh, for example, what is sheet and what is line? Okay. Um, uh, yeah, in my opinion, uh, yeah, we with this method, yeah, we cannot construct such solutions because uh, they always satisfies the the so-called Euler Reynolds equations. And also the velocity field has uh, some finite uh, largest wave number. And uh, those solutions, uh, yeah, as far as I remember, uh, the, the, the each UQ is a smooth solution of the Euler Reynolds equation. So- Specifically the following, there is a well-known solution of Navier-Stokes Burger's uh, cylindrical vortex line. Uh, mm -hmm. Now, uh, you might try to build the Euler solution in the whole space, except this uh, thin cube, which would make that Burgers vortex line. You have zero approximation. Your Burgers vortex line, you just want uh, to uh, find
find the other solution which would make it outside. So that's mm -hmm. a defined problem. I, I'm wondering whether you can solve it with this. Takeshi, did you hear the previous? No, question? sorry, I, yeah. I, I couldn't hear. Well, just hold on. Let me repeat I, if my I... question. Do you hear it now? Yes. Uh, there is a well known solution of Navier-Stokes equation, Berger's vortex, which has uh, a smooth core uh, of the uh, a smooth core of mm -hmm. the viscous thickness in the limit yes, exactly. of of the, in the limit of the Euler theory, it becomes delta function of transverse direction. So it is an infinitely thin vortex line. Question, mm -hmm. can you mm -hmm. find the Euler, weak Euler solutions, which would have singularity, say, around the circular vortex line? So locally, it would be a Berger's vortex. Do you have, can you use your technology to build mm -hmm. numerically such a solution? Uh, yeah, with, uh, with this method, may, in my opinion, we can't. Yeah, uh, it doesn't uh, lead to uh, isolated uh, one vortex. It's all. It's more like a web of uh, vortex lines, wiggled vortex lines. So it involves highly oscillatory um, velocity field. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. My. Yeah. My 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 question is. Uh, Whenever you talk about singularity, whether it's an Euler flow or viscous flow or whatever be the flow, mm -hmm. then uh, uh, it's an unsteady uh, phenomena. And singularity is an unsteady, unpredictable phenomena. And uh, it depends on, uh, um, you see, how you can develop any solution. You can develop any solution. But uh, how do you know I mean, uh, what solution is correct or not? Because uh, there is... See, it will be oscillating right at the, uh, it will be an oscillatory or unsteady solution. And it is not easy to predict that. It depends on what initial conditions you assume uh, and how you develop the solution uh, time-wise right. in a time space. Right, right. So, um, right. Especially and temporarily how you develop the solution. So uh, you can generate any solution uh, in, any, in any type of flow, with, with viscosity or without viscosity. And without uh, with or without any other strain fields, but uh, I mean uh, even predicting is difficult, and uh, um, measuring might be. Uh, and how do you compare it? Of course, you can uh, have a fine resolution of, uh, in the sensors and instrumentation, but mm. uh, then <laughs> if, uh, it's not easy to predict. I mean measure also, and mm. uh, you can predict any solution and compare some solution with. Uh, a measured uh, uh, result, measured data, mm -hmm. and say, mm -hmm. OK, we have predicted all right. But mm -hmm. that may not be a correct prediction, because it depends on initial condition, initial and condition the yeah. boundary mm -hmm. condition also, and how you develop the solution. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. how, uh, yeah, OK. That's that all my, if anyone can comment on that, that will be fine. Right. Yeah, at least uh, one comment I can make here is that, uh, yeah, this method, does not correspond to the initial value problem. Oh, okay. Yeah. It, it, it's it's uh, it start with uh, some initial guess and uh, the velocity fields e evolve as uh, we increase the iteration. And they at the end of the iteration, the velocity field. Yeah, we 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 obtain some velocity field, but uh, it's not a something uh, solve the initial value problem. We arrive yeah, yeah. at some, yeah. Even even if you don't assume the initial condition, I mean, if you mm -hmm. don't assume the initial condition, mm -hmm. or and you develop the field during yeah. iteration, it depends on how you grow the solution or how you make it stable and convergent. Mm -hmm. So you mm -hmm. can obviously you will be making some assumptions. Some yeah, exactly. Yes. For, uh, for uh, yes. getting convergence uh, mm -hmm. uh, during any either uh, any part, uh, intermediate iteration or at the end uh, so or the if, final uh, stage. Yeah, if, if I might interrupt, yeah, I mean the whole idea of this procedure is to 
show explicitly numerically how to generate the solutions which are, you know, uh, which have been shown to be solutions by Buckmaster and mm. his collaborators. Mm. So there's no specific experimental situation that they have in mind. There is a specific mathematical procedure and he's showing you how to do it on a computer. So I think that's... Yeah, that, that is a good... That, uh, that's, it, I mean, I think there's no, yeah, nothing more... I think more I, to, I follow yeah. what you may mean. Let me ask... Oh, I have one question. Yeah. So thanks for a nice talk, Tegasi. Thank so you. My question is for weak solution, the dissipation rate is finite or not finite? I mean, how do you compute it numerically? You get a non-zero value for epsilon? Right, okay, so the... Uh, yeah, in this case, the energy dissipation can be uh, obtained by time derivative of the E of t. So it doesn't have, uh, yeah, of course, uh, we can calculate the energy flux, flux but the, at, the, at the formal level, the energy dissipation can be uh, defined with uh, d, e, yeah, d by dt of the energy, E of t. One question, because it is zero here, so where is right. the energy going? Uh, is it going to kind of you tending to zero? Or can you highlight that aspect? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, I think it's a good question. And they, uh, if I use the uh, the argument pro may, I don't know, argument proposed by the Onsager, that means the the flux is always positive, and the this flux takes out the energy to ever infinitesimally small length scale. So that means to say if it takes it down to infinitesimally small length exactly, scale. Exactly, exactly. Does exactly. it dissipate at all or will it still be in the form of kinetic energy in the form of small vortices? Uh, the vortices right, yes. Mechanical yes. energy is will not dissipate into heat, but it will be in the right. form of mechanical energy itself. Right, yeah, but it's uh, yeah, please. yeah, it's an extreme, uh, yeah, the extreme uh, way of uh, saying that, and uh, and we assume these uh, hydrodynamic description persists at for the infinitesimally small scale. Yeah, that's a some mathematical idea idealization. Okay, I think uh, it has mm. been a great discussion. So let's thank the speaker once again and hopefully continue offline. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Matsumoto. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, right. For those of us who are attending in person, there is a photo session now. So in about uh, no more than five minutes, let's assemble near the staircase in the front. Thank you. <laughs>